All right. So uh, last time, uh, we discussed the idea of social capital as an inherent property of social groups and not as a property of individuals. We talked about how it could arise because of the structure of social interactions and the nature of the interactions, for example, whether they are trusting and so or not and so on. We talked about how social capital was an emergent property of social groups and we reviewed some other examples of emergence. And we discussed diverse properties of social capital, including that it was a public good and some of the reasons that people might underinvest in it, including this idea of social traps where people get caught in suboptimal, uh, groups of people get caught in suboptimal uh, conditions. And today I'm going to be emphasizing how social factors may affect our biology at a much deeper level than we've so far been considering in this class. What, uh, what do we know about how the social becomes biological at the genetic level? And this is, in fact, a growing and cutting-edge field, understanding how it is the case that our social experiences over a lifetime and over evolution may come to be written in our genes in diverse sorts of ways we're going to be introducing today. But we see many examples in the class about how social factors ranging from poverty and education to social support and income inequality can affect our overall health and mortality, and also more proximal measures, like our blood pressure or heart attack risk or immune system function. We've seen many examples of all of those. But the question now is, could something still more profound be going on? So let's consider three ways that social factors could interact uh, with our genome. There could be uh, an evolution in social cultural change. So it could be the case that natural selection and the evolution of human beings across time is affected by social cultural features over time horizons that uh, spread you know, a very long period of time. There could be something known as gene by environment interaction. We're going to discuss all three of these in the next two lectures, so don't stress yet. Uh, gene by social environment interactions. This has to do with how our social environment regulates how our genes might be expressed or how our genes affect how the environment impinges on us. And the third is an even newer field known as social epigenetics, the idea that social exposures actually turn genes on and off in certain uh, specific and discernible ways. So the gene by environment interactions are how the environment shapes whether and how our genes are expressed. And the social, genetic, uh, social epigenetics regulates uh, sort of whether the genes uh, turn on or off in ways that I'll elaborate uh, in just a moment. And we're also going to consider the kind of reverse uh, process, namely how the biological becomes social which is something we haven't thought so much about in the class today. But we're only going to do that in this class in a, one of the most narrow senses, and that's in the field of behavior genetics. That is to say, how do our genes affect not just the structure and function of our bodies, but how they affect, and not even just how they express the structure and function of our minds, but how they affect the structure and function or the aspects of our behavior that we evince. Yeah, in the back. I'm not sure your microphone It's not. Could you still sort of hear me? All right. You could hear me? It's not hard for me to start speaking louder and really try to project, but by the end of the talk, I'm going to be exhausted. Uh, let's see here. buttons here, and by exhaustive, search, <laughs> by exhaustive search, I've concluded that none of them will solve this problem. Okay, so the only alternative is, let's see if one of these things will work. Ah, all right. Here we go, a while here. Excuse me, one second. Okay, can you hear me? Is that, that's not, that's a little, a little amplified? 
which is namely how the biologic can become social, and specifically insofar as social phenotypes, our behaviors, for example, are encoded in our genes in a phenomenon that is known as behavior uh, genetics. And we're going to consider the first two, evolution and social cultural change, and gene by environment interactions or effects, and, behavior, and also behavior genetics today. We'll talk about social epigenetics uh, next time. Now, ordinarily, human beings are seen as evolving under, the pre under sort of environmental pressures of, uh, of different sorts. Um, and they face these pressures over, over very different timescales, or vastly different timescales as the ordinary perspective. So it sort of felt like, actually, we evolved over very long timescales, and over these long timescales, we experience the environment. And the environment can be seen as composed of at least three different uh, components. The first is the physical environment, such as the sunlight or temperature or the water supply in the environment that we as an organism, like any other organism, might face. And second, of course, is the biological environment, the predators or prey or pathogens that we face. And that also, quite obviously, shapes our experience by natural selection of the kind of bodies we have and the kind of physiology we have. But also, there's the social environment. Who and what? Who are the others around us? And what are they doing, for example, that also can be a force of social selection or natural selection? Yet the social environment has often historically been neglected as an evolutionary force. Yet the social factors can actually be crucial. They may, for example, have led us to being intelligent. So the social brain hypothesis that's being advanced by a number of, best, number of labs around the world right now uh, suggests that the reason we humans are intelligent is not the necessity to make tools, but rather the necessity to make friends. That our brains evolved to cope with the necessity or the experience of living in small groups and having to learn to interact with other members of our groups, to cooperate with them or avoid violence by them and so forth. And actually, human beings have very few natural predators. The main killer of human beings is other human beings. That's our predator. And so the evolving the capacity to cope with other human beings has shaped, the argument goes, through a process of natural selection via social environmental changes, the, function, the structure and function of, of our brains. And in fact, one of the reasons we're intelligent is, is this necessity to interact with our conspecifics. Our assembly into groups may have accelerated, if not created, a tendency to think. And this theory stresses the special challenges posed by living in close proximity with other members of one species and confronting the demands of complex social environment involving constant cooperation and competition. Now, what's really interesting about the social environment, unlike the physical and biological environment listed higher up on this list, is that until relatively recently, and with few exceptions, we have historically not been able to change our physical and biological environment. But our social environment is something we humans have been making for tens of thousands of years. So it's only relatively recently, of course, the introduction of fire was an example where we humans could change our, social, our, our physical environment. And there are arguments about how the invention of fire allowed us to cook food and make the extraction of calories from food much more efficient, which then changes the structure of our teeth and the structure of our intestine. Richard Wrangham's book, Catching Fire, discusses this. We have different kinds of intestine and different kinds of teeth and different kinds of masseter muscles because we invented fire you know, a long time ago, which allows us to cook our food and more efficiently extract calories from our food. So that's one example of the physical environmental change. But it's not so common until relatively now, of course, nowadays we can make huge changes to our environment, not just with clothing and other sorts of things, but we can micro-control our physical environment. But our social environment is something humans can always modify. And the argument here is that we have been modifying our social environment. The change in the social environment creates new selection pressures which feed back on us, reinforce certain kinds of bodies and minds, which then create a new social environment which feeds back and reinforces it again, a kind of macro feedback loop, okay? Where we create a social environment and then it affects our, our genes in very uh, specific sorts of ways. And in fact, we humans may have been changing our social environment in ways that affect our genes, not just over long time horizons, uh, but even over historical uh, time periods. So for example, the customary way we think about the way in which natural selection works has historically been over hundreds of thousands of years. So for example, the social brain hypothesis 
is on order 100,000. That is to say that our social interactions over that time frame have resulted in us having the kind of cognition we have today. But it's also, as shown in your readings and as we'll discuss today, the case that sociocultural changes that human beings have been making have been reshaping our genes over order thousands of years. That actually we are evolving in real time, even today, in response to the kinds of worlds we create for ourselves. And in fact, the effect of genes and their regulation can even occur over ultra short time periods over tens of years. Now in that case, I, do not, I am not claiming that uh, environmental changes are leading to genetic transformation of our species over decades, although I, they are leading to changes over eons, thousands of years, as we'll discuss in a moment. But there are other sorts of processes we're going to discuss today and next time that can work over time horizons as short as uh, 10 years. So, in fact, the first two have to do with allelic change, that is to say the operation of natural selection, changing alleles or variants of genes, so the genes that you're equipped with kinds of variants of genes that all of you have, and me too, uh, uh, reflect the operation of environmental changes over long and medium range uh, time horizons. But the short time horizons has to do with regulatory effects, gene by environment interactions, and this idea of genetics that we'll be discussing next time. Now if we grant the relevance and salience of our social environment, and if we see the social environment as malleable over historic time, because we humans, over periods of time ranging in centuries, create new societies for ourselves, it begs the question of whether we are evolving in real time in observable ways in response to social changes we are both genetically and non-genetically compelled to make. Now, what's crucial to understand here is that our biology and our culture have always been in a conversation. So for example, Raise your hands if you've, uh, if you've ever been to a colonial house or to a medieval uh, castle, for example, and you've looked at the beds where those people slept in and they looked kind of uncomfortable and small. Everyone ever noticed that the beds are small? Why were those beds small compared to your beds? Yeah? The people were smaller. People were smaller. And so what happened in the last few hundred years that our beds have changed? Yes, you? What's your name? We're healthier, yeah, we're healthier. So we've gotten bigger, we've had a socio-cultural change, we've gotten richer, we have better nutrition, and that socio-cultural change has changed our biology, we've gotten taller, and because we've gotten taller, we've had this biological change, it's fed back to and caused architectural changes. So there's been a kind of interaction, a conversation between our biology, our height, and our culture, our building design, our furniture design, that's going, uh, that's going in, that, uh, in that direction. This is a biological effect of a cultural development where we are getting taller as a result of sort of changes in our society. And taller people require a change in architecture, which is a cultural effect of a biological development. So there's been that kind of a conversation between our, our sort of sociocultural development and our biology for a long time. But that's different than what we're talking about today which is a kind of evolution, a change at the genetic level uh, in our species. And the best example we have so far of such macro-historical developments, how they could affect our genes, is the evolution of lactose tolerance in adults, an example that was richly described in your readings. It's a very famous and very important uh, example. Because the ability of adults to digest lactose off confers evolutionary advantages only when a stable supply of milk is available, such as after the time when milk-producing animals, such as sheep, cattle, or goats, uh, have been domesticated. So raise your hands if you can digest, you can drink milk in your, you can drink milk, you're all adults. Okay. Raise your hands if uh, you really can't drink milk, it's just very uncomfortable. Okay. Raise your hands if you just don't, doesn't sit well, you have a little diarrhea, and some indigestion. Some of you, Jeff, when as soon as I put the word diarrhea on the table, you won't see it. <laughs> but, you know, there's lactose, uh, there's, there's, there's intermediate, lactose intermediate persistence, lactase intermediate, per intermediate persistence, LIP, lactase persistence into adulthood, and then lactose non-persistence, lactase non-persistence, which is it. Now, ask yourself this, none of you are suckling at your mother's breasts. And that's why you have the ability to digest milk when you were little, was to drink milk and acquire it as a nutritional source. In our ancestral state, 
We didn't, couldn't drink milk, we couldn't digest milk, we had no lactase, the enzyme that digests the principal sugar uh, in milk, because uh, we didn't drink milk, it wasn't in our diet, there was nowhere to get it, okay? And so most of the population prior to 10 or 20,000 years ago was unable to digest lac lactose as adults. Is everyone with me so far? But now all of you are, by and large, able to, or many of you, most of you are able to do so. Why? Why do you all have persistence of this enzyme into adulthood, whereas our forebears did not? Well, the reason is the environment changed. And natural selection now made it advantageous for you to be able to digest milk. Well, what changed in the environment? There became a supply of milk available to adults to drink. And why did that change occur? Because we humans invented it. We created a culture, we domesticated animals, and when we domesticated animals, now all of a sudden, our environment was different. And those of us who could digest milk into adulthood had a fitness advantage. Why? Because we had an additional source of food that wasn't available to every other adult, and an additional source of hydration when the water was spoiled. So when there's a lot of little water or bad water, the rest of you who can't digest lactose, can't drink milk, and the rest of those of us who can't, I don't need to stigmatize the lactose you know, intolerant, but um, for the purposes of this scientific example, I'm speaking in this very personal way. But, uh, but anyway, you get the idea that you can actually, there's an advantage, and this has resulted in the widespread diffusion of this, and it turns out there are several mutations in the human uh, population. And one of the things that's amazing about this example is that there have been several adaptive mutations which have occurred over widely separated uh, populations in Africa and Europe just over the last 3,000 to 9,000 years. So here is acting over historical time. The culture that we humans make for ourselves is being written into our genes, is changing the kind of genes, allelic variants that we have, reshaping our bodies at the genetic level because of a kind of social change, a cultural change, a technological innovation that's occurring in our population, now not like fire over hundreds of thousands of years, but over historical time, things that we can imagine and actually can document. And moreover, distinctly, it's occurred several times. It's not just once that this occurred. It's so common that multiple milk domesticating animal cultures have repeatedly had this natural evolution of the ability to digest um, lactose. This is a map of phenotype, and, uh, and these mutations, however, have been historically principally seen in populations of people who were herders and not in nearby populations who retained a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So the, 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 the claim being made in this classic paper that was assigned in your readings, or a, a description of it was assigned, is that you only see these mutations where it's advantageous where people have domesticated animals. In nearby societies where they haven't domesticated animals, you don't see these mutations. And so what this chart shows is the persistence of, uh, is, is the, uh, I forgot which side is which, let me see here. Yeah, so these are the phenotypes over here, and, uh, and these are the, uh, you know, the groups over here, and whether or not they have uh, the genotypes. So here are whether they have lactase uh, persistence is the light blue, and lactase non-persistence is the dark blue, and then you look at who, who are the herders and who are not the herders, and there's a correspondence between the two uh, in the various populations. So, so the Hadza are hunter-gatherers, and uh, more than half of them have trouble digesting uh, lactose uh, as adults, uh, compared to other populations who've domesticated uh, animals uh, much more. So on the right is the proportion of various genotypes in each region, uh, and on the left uh, is, the, uh, is the phenotypes. And the, side, the pie charts are an approximate geographic location of the sample individuals. And the claim in this paper is that there's a correspondence between phenotypes, genotypes, and herding behaviors. And that in addition, this is an example of convergent evolution in response to the social environment, where multiple different mutations have arisen within the same, uh, with the same phenotype. So that it's not just one off that this has occurred, but many times that this has occurred. And there are similar events in Europe, coupled with population migration, and it's possible to trace all this out. So we can look at founding populations of the European continent. For example, here we can map Europe as a fraction of individuals with lactose tolerance and say, okay, well, in the Scandinavian countries, over 80% do, 
and here's what we each over here, sort of being more than half of what we do, and it begins to fall off as you move into sort of the uh, Middle East. And then you can actually trace out the migrations of different populations and find sort of original settlement area of members of the, li of the uh, linear pottery culture and location of the first humans who were lactose tolerant and then sort of see well they domesticated cattle and what happens. And anthropologists and archaeologists and geneticists have worked all this out and seen, or much of it out, or some of it out, a lot of it out, and seen you know, how these migrations and how these changes may have occurred. And there was, in fact, been a co-evolution of, of the expansion of crop cultivation, domestication of cattle and other animals, and lactose tolerance. But, in fact, that's just the best example we have. There are actually many examples of things we humans do, social things, that feed back and change or reshape our genome. Similar possibilities expanding beyond uh, animal domestication. So the development of agriculture, for example, is another thing we've done over historical time, 10,000 years, uh, that has changed our, our, uh, our genome. Is that a raised hand? No. Uh, there's increasing population density. So we are now living a larger number of people per square mile than we used to live. And that has implications for us. You're bumping into more people as you go about your business. So on any given day, you might be exposed to many more pathogens than you would have been exposed to, for example, you know, thousands of years ago. We've migrated into higher altitudes. So we've chosen to develop technology that allows us to live at higher altitudes. And that also, could, the ability to do that and the, and the desire to live there creates a kind of selection pressure on us and can also reshape the kind of hemoglobin we have and the hemoglobin metabolism. We have rules regarding endogamy. We have cultural rules that specify who you can marry and who you cannot marry. And those rules, which are cultural rules, have significant implications for mating and as a result for sort of long runs of homozygosity or certain other kinds of genetic uh, features that can be measured in human populations. Family size has changed over the last couple of hundred years. And this also has implications because when you have smaller families, you have lower probability of inbreeding. And, fi and finally, medicine. I think it's entirely possible that human populations are becoming more myopic because we've been medieval lens grinders have invented glasses. Those of us that wear glasses 100,000 or 10,000 years ago, we would be dead, right? The lions would have eaten us. Uh, the rest of you <coughs> would be fine, or maybe you'd have other problems, but you would at least be able to see. So, um, so now I can pass on my genes, and I can have children who, you know, are myopic. And so you can imagine now that the lactase persistence in reverse, now there's no longer a selection, as much of a selection advantage in being able to see well, so our bodies are reshaped, and then our genes are ultimately reshaped over historical time. In fact, many medical advances that take people and say, when I was in medical school, we used to take care of sickle cell patients, who were almost all African American, and they, we were taught, first of all, they had horrible pain, they had sickle crises that were in terrible, terrible pain. It was very difficult to, to treat these patients' pain. They often became, people used to say they were addicted to narcotics. That's really not fair to say, because they needed the narcotics to treat truly agonizing pain. Uh, and they would have, we would treat them with narcotics, and the argument was always that they would die before they were able to reproduce. That sicklers, the longest living sickler, I think, when I was in, in medical school, was a 32-year-old person, and everyone in the country knew about him. Like, he was a special, unique case of a guy that had lived that long. And people with sickle cell disease died in their, in their teens or early 20s. And as you probably all remember from high school biology, sickle cell disease is a kind of single gene mutation. And you probably remember from your little Punnett squares when you were in high school biology, or like a little P's example from Mendel, you know, you could either be homozygous for non-sickle, heterozygous for sickle, in which case you have a mild condition, and you could pass it on to your children if you made it with someone who was heterozygous, or you were homozygous for the sickle gene, and then you got the disease. And now, people who are homozygous for sickle cell disease survive and often have quite long lives. And those people, quite understandably, reproduce. And so that medical technology is changing the prevalence of this one gene in the population, you see? And the same thing applies with many other conditions where we intervene, medicine intervenes, and because, and, I, and I'm not suggesting that we should let anyone die a natural death, They're quite the opposite. What I'm suggesting is that the, this powerful technology that has been invented by humans over the last hundred years and will endure over the next thousand, that a thousand years from now, 
people will look back, let's say, at modern medicine as an example like agriculture or the domestication of cattle that I'm showing you uh, today. And, um, and, and, and on the issue that there's similar examples that can be told about relatively recent mutations that confer advantages in terms of surviving epidemic diseases such as typhoid in Europe. So these epidemic diseases became much more common when you had high density settlements, which became possible when we had the agricultural and technological revolutions, and when we had trade, when we built ships and engaged in commercial activities, so people began to move the same individual long distances, so you now began to have much more frequent epidemics in our species, and in turn, this reshaped, because then only certain ones of us with certain mutations that allowed us to survive or increase the probability of survival, given these mutations, survived. So those of us that are descendants now of those people who survived, for example, the, uh, the epidemics that plagued Europe in the medieval times, have, are different than those of us that would have survived if there hadn't been such epidemics. And in fact, one of the arguments about cystic fibrosis, another single gene disease that primarily affects Caucasians, is that the burden of cystic fibrosis is a consequence of people who were heterozygous for a certain CF genes were more likely to survive typhoid epidemics in Europe. With a consequence that now, occasionally, they mate with each other, and you've got homozygous individuals, and those individuals suffer. Just like malaria, so sickle is an adaptive heterozygous, people who are heterozygous for sickle cell trait are better able to survive in malaria regions, which is why that gene has persisted across time. So it confers an advantage. Raise your hands if you study the classic case of sickle cell disease in high school or college biology. So most of you have studied that case. Um, so here's another example then. So the density of human settlements changes our genes. And this, these stimuli that we're speaking of, these sociocultural stimuli, can be technological, as in the case of animal domestication or medicine, or social, as in the case of population density or family size. The Tibetans, who split off from the Han Chinese and settled high altitudes, uh, and which was a collective cultural action, have different hemoglobin metabolism and re related genes than the original populations of the Han Chinese. Actually, there are other very subtle arguments about the genes that are in the Tibetans that make it possible for them to live at high altitudes and be so well adapted, have to do with uh, potential crossbreeding thousands of years ago with certain other human populations, which I won't go into. And another example would be that the development of agriculture changed the biology of malaria. So in certain parts of Africa, when we began to cultivate crops, what we did at the time is, is we created little tiny small pools of water. In tilling the land, we create a completely different environment for malaria mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes now, their biology has changed because humans are reshaping the land. And because the biology of the mosquitoes changes, the biology and life cycle of the parasites, the malaria parasites change. And now all of a sudden you get a, a cycle, of, a, a sort of a three-way interaction between the humans, the mosquitoes, and the malaria parasites, where we are changing our environment, which changes the mosquito selection environment, which changes the experience of the malaria parasite, which then feeds back and leads to a number of changes in humans, not just sickle cell trait, but also something known as G6PD, or G6 glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, which is seen to arise in populations between 1,600 and 12,000 years ago in areas where these types of changes uh, were afoot. Increasing population size in the last 10,000 years, again made possible by cultural evolution, may have accelerated genetic change in yet another way. Because more people means more possible new adaptive mutations. An agricultural revolution fostered larger, tolerable population sizes and these then fed back to genetic evolution. So when you have larger populations, it's more likely that in that larger population, by chance, an advantageous mutation will arise among the large population than among the small population. And so when you create, when you, when you domesticate animals and suddenly make a world in which we have agriculture, so we can feed more humans, and you invent cities and do other things that make it possible for more people to survive, our population has exploded, right, in the last few thousand years. Now, all of a sudden, you create larger populations, among which a chance mutation may occur in a way that wouldn't have occurred if we were a small population. And so that then, that mutation can then spread through the human population. And so our change in population density, all our size is also changing 
our genes. And in fact, there is evidence that as many as 1,800 out of the 22,000 human genes are actively being selected for in historical time, and that some of the stimuli for this might well be human created. So about 10% of our genes right now are changing, allelic variants are changing, because of what we humans are doing culturally, and socially, kind of world and technological, kind of worlds we're creating for ourselves is changing the environment, which is feeding back and changing, uh, creating kind of natural selection and changing who we are at a very deep genetic level, not just at the other levels we've been discussing so far in the class. Is that clear? I think that's amazing, actually. I mean, I've been becoming more and more interested in this topic over the last five or 10 years. And they, my lab doesn't do much work in this area, but we're beginning to think of doing work in this area. And I've been reading the work of other labs and just every year. I'm, you know, my eyes are getting more and more bug-eyed. In fact, it's one of those things as a scientist which is so annoying because when I first started reading about these things 10 years ago, I knew it was really cool and I just should have done it. Because now, I'm so late to the party that I'll never catch up. And, but it's an amazing set of ideas, actually. And it's a really nice example of, of the intersection of the natural and the social sciences, which is where I think one of the most important scientific frontiers is, is today. So if you think about the sciences, if you, if you, if you are a scientist or you're thinking about science, sciences, you can imagine there are the computational sciences, there are the biological sciences, and there are the social sciences. And I'm leaving out the physical sciences because I, you know, I, I am. Uh, <laughs> You can imagine the intersection between all of these areas. You know, sort of. You've got, you've got, you've got, you know, systems biology and computational genomics over here. You've got, you know, computational social sciences and sort of new mathematical ways of understanding society over here. And today we're talking about this intersection. And you know, in my lab we try to inhabit this this intersection uh, over there. Okay. Um, and this table taken from your readings summarizes many of the examples we've been discussing so far today. So on the left, we have functions or phenotypes, and on the right, we have inferred cultural selection pressures. Why do we have the bodies and phenotypes and behaviors that we do? And what might have been the cultural and social historical forces that may have contributed to us having those types of features? So for example, we talked about the digestion of milk and dairy products, and how that may be related to dairy farming and so forth. There's the detoxification of plant secondary compounds. So our bodies are able to detoxify all kinds of toxins and things we eat. But those toxins, only those abilities only became relevant when we domesticated plants and changed the nature of the diets that we had. We have all kinds of immunity and pathogen response and resistance to malaria and other crowd diseases, which relate to, on the right-hand side, dispersal, agriculture, aggregation, and, and so forth that I've already been uh, introduced you to. We have energy metabolism, higher cold tolerance, and heat shock genes, which again relate to humans' ability to migrate. So we invent technology that makes it possible for us to live um, you know, in, the, in the great north. If you've ever, raise your hands if you've ever taken an anthropology class and read an ethnography. Oh, for the love of God. You, you all have to do that, okay? Just you read an ethnographic description of another society that is adapted to live in the desert or in the Amazon or amongst the Inuit. And you look at the technology that the Inuit have. They invent parkas, for the love of God. They invent harpoons. They invent ways of surviving in an environment which any one of you would die within hours if you were exposed to, right? But in inventing that technology that permits them to live there, they acquire different body types than the Maasai, who live in a completely different uh, environment over uh, historical time. Uh, by the way, by emphasizing these differences, I don't mean to suggest that if people are people everywhere, so please don't misunderstand me. And the vast majority of, your, of all of your genes are the same. The, uh, there are very few differences, inter-individual differences between any of you. Uh, external visible phenotypes about skin pigmentation, hair thickness, eye and hair color, and freckles also probably reflects dispersal and local adaptation. And sexual selection. People have crazy new ideas about why we have blue eyes. Has anyone ever thought that if it's such a recessive mutation, why is it so common? Everyone thought about this? Why the hell do we have blue eyes? I'll leave that as an exercise for you to go read. Um, why do some people have blue eyes? Uh, nervous system, brain function, development, language skills, and vocal learning, again, re must reflect complex cognition on which culture is reliant. Social intelligence idea that we introduce, language use, and vocal learning, 
I think the fact that we invented the printing press 500 years ago is selecting for a different kind of person before you had printed language. So before you had printed language, maybe you needed to remember things orally better. You know, orally, A-U-R-A-L-L-Y. But maybe now for the printing press, those of us that really don't hear so well can actually survive uh, in a different sort of way. Uh, skeletal development, uh, again, may reflect some dispersal and so, so, uh, sexual selection. Our jaw muscle uh, fibers, our tooth enamel thickness, and so forth, almost surely reflect the invention of cooking and uh, of fire. So there are many possible examples. People are working on all of these actively right now, trying to sort out the extent to which these sorts of things are the case. And in fact, rules and practices and circumstances favoring endogamy, that is to say, cultures in which most of you have, many of you still live in such cultures where you're told you only can marry people of your own type, whatever that type is, religion, ethnicity, race, language, education, whatever it is. Others of you don't feel such constraints, but the great majority of the world lives under a constraint in which they're supposed to marry someone like themselves. And this type of, uh, these rules and practices and circumstances that favor endogamy is another factor that affects our genome. This is the global uh, distribution of marriages between couples related to second cousins or closer. Because if you're required to marry someone like yourself, often you wind up marrying your cousin. And that actually has implications for the survival and fitness of your offspring. And in fact, mortality uh, worldwide, couples related closer than second cousins and their progeny account for about 10% of the global population. So this slide shows consanguineous marriages and what fraction of the population they are. And there are certain parts of the world where people are literally marrying their, their cousins with great uh, frequency. And, uh, and that has implications. But that is the genetic implications of a social rule, right? You're not required to specify. I mean, in principle, you can marry whoever you want. But we invent rules that specify who you must marry. And this feeds back and affects the kind of uh, genomes uh, in our progeny. And mortality in first cousin's progeny is perhaps 3.5% higher. So it's not like if cousins reproduce, you're going to produce like a monster. That's not what typically happens at all. But there is a discernible and notable higher likelihood of serious mutations amongst uh, unions between first cousins or closer. Now, a decline in consanguineous marriage is expected to reduce the prevalence of complex genetically based diseases. And there's several contemporary social processes which are affecting and mainly reducing the prevalence of consanguineous marriages. So we already talked a little bit about population density, group size, migration, urbanization, and smaller family sizes, all of which affect the availability of unrelated partners, right? All of those social changes change the probability that you will wind up marrying someone who is actually uh, related to you. And so do norms regarding marriage. And we were all probably relatively consanguineous for much of our history. If you look amongst the Hadza, for example, they tend to marry, they don't have a choice. All Hadza are actually reasonably closely related. Um, this affected the existence of homozygosity in long stretches of our genome for lots of uh, historical time. And on the other hand, it turns out that fitness is parabolic in consanguinity. And actually, maybe with your third to fourth cousin, maybe optimal. So actually, if you plot, if you plot the genetic relatedness between, uh, between mates, between spouses, so you have some coefficient of relatedness, R. So here's if you marry your, your sister, let's say, or your brother. Uh, and this is if you marry your cousin, and your second cousin, and your third cousin, and your fourth cousin, and your fifth cousin, and so forth. And here is the, uh, your, your uh, fitness measured as the survival of offspring, the fraction of descendants that you have that survive. Actually, it's parabolic with a peak around the third to fourth cousins. So you have lower fitness if you marry your sibling or your cousin, but you also have lower fitness if you marry someone. I'm not making any moral or prescriptive statements. Do not take this out and say, oh, you need to go marry someone that's just so. It's not at all what I'm saying. You should marry anyone you want, okay? I'm just describing a scientific state of affairs, so please don't misconstrue me. Uh, but it turns out if you marry someone that's too dissimilar from you, that also has lower fitness because actually our genes co-evolve with each other. So certain variants of certain genes that I have are adapted to the existence of certain variants of certain other genes that I have. And those genes have been moving synchronously down, the, uh, uh, down uh, my descent 
through my ancestors. And now if I marry someone that's too dissimilar from me, this positive variant of this gene might suddenly be found with a completely different variant of this other gene if I marry someone too dissimilar from me. So this paper was published in Science a few years ago, and it shows that in using an Icelandic population, shows that fitness is parabolic in consanguinity, so that very related individuals and very unrelated individuals produce fewer surviving offspring than individuals related at the third or fourth cousin level. Now, raise your hands if you, assuming you have first cousins, if you know your first cousins. Okay, raise your hands if you have second cousins, if you know your second cousins. So it's mostly, raise your hands if you have third cousins, third cousins, if you know your third cousins. Amazing, you guys know your third cousins? Wow. Well, I'm surprised by that. I actually expected fewer hands. How do you know your third cousin? My mom's kid, well, like my grandma's sister's great grandma. Your grandma's sister, that's your second cousin. Okay, the kids. That's your second cousin once removed. So if your child knows that person, then who actually knows, who can give me an example of a third cousin? Yes? Great grandma's sister. Yes. Do you know that person? Oh, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> so you know your second cousin once removed? Wow, that's impressive. Others of you? Anyone else know their second cousin once removed? Yeah, yeah, Leah, yeah. Anyone know their third cousin? Yes, can you, why do you know your third cousin? Um, my mom's from Afghanistan, so she used to live with her entire family, so she had a hundred and thirty cousins. <laughs> okay, so but how do you know your third cousin? So you can you know for example the descendants of your great grandma. Not every single one. But in the, what? Okay, is he a nice guy? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, so that's amazing. So does anyone know other than you? Does anyone know their fourth cousins? Okay, good. So most of us don't know our fourth cousins. In fact, it's very very rare that anyone actually knows their fourth cousins. Um, anyway. Now, the point, though, in describing this is the importance of marriage rules as a kind of cultural isolation, a kind of insular group that we form, is illuminated by comparing the level of homozygosity in Native Americans and Middle Easterners. So when you have a lot of inbreeding, raise your hands if you've ever worked with white mice, white rats, right? And how are those created? By many generations of inbreeding. And when you do that, you have like homozygous, they're all clones of each other, they're all the same in every locus, they're homozygous in every locus, and they're very unfit animals, they couldn't survive in the wild. Uh, and, and, and so long runs of homozygosity in the genome uh, is, uh, is a, a, a proxy or a measure for inbreeding. And the levels of homozygosity in Native Americans and Middle Easterners is very similar, but for totally different reasons. In the case of Native Americans, it's because it was a small founder population that came over the Bering Strait, right? And so all the descendants, there were a few other things that happened. Yes, the Norse came over, and there was probably some mating, and probably some people in Polynesia literally floated across the Pacific and wound up in Latin and South America and mated with someone. But by and large, there were a couple of settlements, a couple of movements across the Bering Strait. And so we have founder populations of Native Americans, and so Native Americans are relatively more inbred than the rest of the world because of the founder effect. Hmm? Middle Easterners have the same amount of homozygosity, but for totally different reasons. Because, of religion because religion specifies who you can marry. So it's functionally equivalent, having this social rule, to this, uh, this migration, this founder effect of a small uh, population. Again, a social factor affecting our genome over relatively long uh, timescales. Here's a ridiculously extreme example of the impact of culture. This is an example of the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, which has its own website you can go to, maybe live long and die out. So you can sign up for this website and promise not to reproduce. And this, these people want to persuade everyone, every human on the planet to not reproduce. That would be a big genetic effect of a cultural uh, feature if we all unified, we jointly decided that we weren't going to reproduce and voluntarily decide to make ourselves extinct. And the FAQ on this website says it all. There's a little FAQ and it says about the movement, what is the voluntary human extinction movement? Are you really serious? 
Are some people are some people opposed to the voluntary human extinction movement concept? Yes, I'm opposed. Uh, what's new? How do I join? And how do I order stickers, T-shirts, and stuff? <laughs> and then they have a whole set of questions called biology and breeding. And they say, what's wrong with having babies? Don't you like babies? Uh, aren't the wrong people making babies these days? Which is an interesting question. I'm extra smart. Shouldn't I pass on my genes? No, you too need to go to state. Uh, what about the human instinct to breed? Do we have to stop having sex? To which the answer is no, just don't reproduce. Uh, does the movement favor abortion? And will contraception lower birth rates? Anyway, the point is that you can buy a t-shirt from them if you wanted and say that that's one thing you learned in my class about how culture could affect our genes. And importantly, and as a distinct idea, genes and culture can co-evolve. So we've talked about this feedback loop already, but this feedback loop is different than the one-way tie. So it's, it's one thing for me to say, and it's true, that culture can affect our genes, but now I want to add to that wrinkle that culture affects our genes, and genes affect our culture, and you can create this kind of feedback loop which can reinforce genetic change in a vast feedback loop. So here's the idea that there's biological evolution, which you're all familiar with, uh, where genes interact, genes can lead to behavior, behavior leads to different kinds of biological fitness, which, lead, uh, which can feed back to, uh, to affect the genes, and you can have a kind of a biological evolution and a kind of feedback amongst the genes. There's cultural evolution, where genes can affect the behavior, and behavior can affect the genes, and so forth. And there's gene culture co-evolution, which is the fact that we can have this recursion between cultural changes across time, for instance, as you perfect technology. So let me give you an example. Let's say, I don't know if this is true, this is very speculative, we invent stone tools, and when we invent stone tools, those among us who can use stone tools are more likely to survive, and so that technology selects for people who are, let's say, better able to make better grasp of rocks and their ability to withstand sparks or whatever it might be. And then those people who are better able to make stone tools are more likely to survive, and that feeds back to the kinds of genes we have, and then those people who are better able to survive feeds back to the kind of tools we make. So over time, the people that are making those flaked arrows um, four million years after the first people cut stone flakes aren't the same people biologically, and they're not the same people in part because of the creation of this technology, which is creating this kind of feedback uh, loop. Now, so that's the first broad step, that culture can change our genes, and the argument there is that it changes the sequence, the DNA sequence, and it leads to different allelic variants, alleles, different versions of genes in human beings, and that it can do so under the pressure of social and cultural factors over historical time. We reviewed a couple or several examples of that. And then at the end of that discussion, we talk about not only how culture can shape our genes, but in shaping our genes, genes can feed back and shape our culture. And so you get a kind of feedback loop, which is a distinct idea. Everyone with me so far? OK, that's the first idea for today. Now we're going to move to a completely different idea, which is gene by environment interactions, which has nothing to do with the sequence of our genes and doesn't work over thousands of years, but works over the lifetime of an individual. And this is the, the next way that the social can become biological, or gene by environment effects. Um, and so, but to understand this, we first have to review a way that the biological can become social, namely behavior genetics. So to understand the claim that our genes and our, 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 the environment can regulate the expression of our genome, we first have to understand what we mean when we talk about behavior genetics, the fact that our genes can affect our behaviors. And the key technique for behavior genetics in the past 30 years has been twin studies, something we've already introduced a couple of times before uh, in the class. So twin studies, uh, we're interested in twin studies and the genetic basis for social phenotypes. And so heritability is that is the proportion of phenotypic variation in a population that's attributable to genetic variation among individuals. And twin studies take dizygotic and monozygotic twins who are either reared together or reared apart. And as we discussed, I stood over here a few lectures ago, and I cultivated this intuition. And you remember, what you do in a twin study is you get pairs of monozygotic twins, identical twins. You, you, you measure a trait in them, like their height. And you see how much is my height correlated with my twin's height. 
And you do that for a large stack of pairs of twins. And then you see how intercorrelated is the height of all the monozygotic twins. And then you do that separately for same-sex dizygotic twins. How correlated is the height of dizygotic twins? And you do that for a whole stack of dizygotic twins. And then, as the last step, you compare these two correlation coefficients and ask, are they different or are they not? If they're not different, genes don't play a role, right? But if they are different and the monozygotic is higher, the correlation of the height among monozygotic twins is higher than the correlation of the height among dizygotic twins, you conclude that genes play a role in height. And so there's like four years of work on this area, and when they look at a variety of social phenotypes, no, not height, they find that heritability of many social phenotypes is on the order of 0.35 to 0.55. And that this heritability of these social phenotypes, like how cooperative you are, for example, or your taste in sexual partners, for example, uh, is roughly equal to the heritability of biological phenotypes, including major depression, alcoholism, and so forth. So these social phenotypes are as heritable as biological uh, phenotypes. And here's some social behaviors arising from genetic variation and the extent to which these traits are correlated between monozygotic and dizygotic uh, twins. And I think this was in your reading. Uh, so here, for example, pro-social behavior in boys. So monozygotic twins are in blue, dizygotic twins are in red. So pro-social behavior in boys is much more correlated amongst the monozygotic twins than amongst the dizygotic twins. So pro-social behavior in boys probably has a genetic component. But for example, girls' social responsiveness is there's less of a difference. So maybe social responsiveness in girls is less related to genes. Maybe that's more culture. Maybe girls are taught to be more socially sensitive, for example. Uh, so uh, here is uh, political attitudes. There's some difference uh, in aggressiveness in males. Leadership probability. Parental warmth uh, is a big difference between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Risk behavior, uh, and so forth. And notice that these traits vary in their overall level of heritability. So there are two different things happening here. Some traits are much more genetic than other traits. And in some traits, there's much more correlation between uh, the twins uh, than, than other traits. Now, it's crucial to realize that twins only share 50% of their genes in expectation. And chance can play, can play out in all sorts of ways. So fraternal twins, guys that got twins, are, uh, are, uh, have 50% of their genes only in expectation. Actually, you can share 51% of your genes with your sibling or 52, or in theory, you could be an identical twin with your sibling born years apart. If all the meiotic uh, changes happened exactly the right way across the whole genome, which is infinitesimally unlikely, you could be an identical twin with your five-year-old younger sibling. So it's only an expectation with large numbers. Most of us are 51 to 49% similar to our siblings, our fraternal siblings. But Sometimes you get very unusual outcomes. For example, Lucy and Maria Eilmer uh, are twins. These people, these young women, are twins, and they're from Gloucester, United Kingdom. And they're two of the five children born to their white father and, quote, half Jamaican mother. And while their other siblings have a blend of features from their parents, Lucy and Mary, Maria are complete opposites in their skin color, at least. And no, in the quote, this is one uh, Lucy speaking. No one ever believes we are twins because I am white and Maria is black, she said. Even when we dress alike, we still don't even look like sisters, let alone twins. And I thought it was so cute the way she said, oh, if we dress alike, we would, you know, people would see us as alike. And I think that speaks to the kind of you know, ridiculousness of racism, actually. Uh, so here are these two young women are twins, and here is their, um, here is their whole family, mom, dad, uh, and the other kids, and, uh, and here are the little girls. So twins are only 50% the same in expectation. They don't need to be that identical. Is that point clear? Is that a cute example of what? <laughs> so cute. Their little girls are so cute. Uh, and they're now college students in England. So the effect of genes is not restricted to the structure and function of our bodies, but also can affect our minds and our behaviors, including traits as diverse as religiosity, friendliness, novelty seeking, altruism, and so on. And we saw earlier in the course that religion, or religiosity, not religion, religiosity is partly heritable. So there are all these social behavioral traits that can be explained by our genes. And in the past decade or so, we've moved beyond twin studies to probe the effect of specific genotypic variants 
on specific phenotypes. And the effects of individual genes we've now shown in the last 10 years are actually, and somewhat surprisingly, extremely small. The vast majority of things do not look at all like the classic examples of Mendel's peas or sickle cell disease you learned about in introductory biology. Phenotypes typically depend on many genes acting together in unfathomably complex ways, with each gene making a small contribution. So actually, the classic examples you guys study in high school or college bio introductory biology are actually prototypic examples. Most phenotypes need 100 different genes, each making a small contribution to have uh, their effect. And as a result, when you can identify a gene that has an effect on a complex phenotype, often that gene, the variants of that gene, have very small effects. For example, a team of hundreds of scientists around the world recently completed a massive genome-wide association study of educational attainment that required 125,000 people's genotypes to look for what genes might there be in humans that were associated with the amount of years of schooling they completed, a social phenotype. And three independent locations on the genome, so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or variations at a single locus, a single uh, base pair in the, the DNA, were significantly associated with attainment. But not surprisingly, the effect sizes were incredibly small. The R squared was 0.02 percent, uh, less than less than two hundredths of a percent of the variation in educational attainment was explained by variation on this gene. Please do not leave this course thinking that genes are the main driver of educational inequality in our society. Genes are an infinitesimal negligible fraction. The main, courses of, main sources of socioeconomic inequality in our society are social, things we do to each other. Okay? But it's also true that there are very tiny variations uh, in genes that can play a role in how much education uh, people acquire. And this, and this effect is so tiny that it corresponds to approximately one month of schooling per risk allele. This slide shows the peak uh, association in a specific spot of the genome uh, with educational attainment. So as you go down the genome, as you start on one end of the DNA and move down to the other side, and you're asking, would a change in this specific, specific location in the DNA affect educational attainment? No. How about here? No. How about here? No. How about here? No. You're maybe a little bit, you know, but bang, it's starting to spike. So here are changes. So if you get a different variant here, if you flip from an A to a T, for example, those individuals have a slightly higher risk of having more educational uh, attainment. And again, just to reiterate, unless I misunderstood, I'm not saying that genes determine education wholly by any stretch of the imagination. And in any case, in addition to that intellectual claim, in addition to the statement that genes are not the only or even the main source of variation, although they are a source of variation, there's an additional claim which is that genes encode a variety of potential biological selves. So what the genes do is they give a kind of a, 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 a permissive, they create a kind of set of bodies we might acquire, which then sociocultural factors can intervene on and determine what kind of bodies we ultimately wind up having. Which biological self gets realized can depend in part on the environmental and social conditions we experience over the life course in a variety of ways. The human genome is basically static during the life of an individual, but its actions are not. What your genes do in your body can change, and those changes in turn can be responses to the environment. So here now we're getting to the second idea, which is how your genes, which, what effect your genes have can depend on what environment I place you in, right? So you may have one set of genes that have certain variants, and if I put you in this environment, you get this kind of body, and if I put you in a different environment, you get a different kind of body, right? You have a different experience. So the environment shapes how the genotype is mapped to the phenotype. And that's the classic example of this, is the Caspi study that was in your readings. And that's what this study uh, uh, says. That is, regardless of whether the gene is wholly or partially responsible for a physical or behavioral phenotype, the environment may determine whether the gene is expressed. And an individual's response to the environment may depend on what genes you have. So it works both ways. Whether you respond to a particular environment, you depend on your genes, and whether your genes have an effect may depend on your environment. It's a gene by environment interaction. And this is what is meant by that expression. Here the idea is that whether a gene expresses itself depends on the environment, and specifically, we're talking about the social environment. 
You can imagine other genes that have to do with detoxifying toxins in the environment or coping with physical, you know, cold. Uh, you know, you might have certain genes which don't cause illness if you only live in sunny climates, but if I move you to a hot climate, now all of a sudden you get a different body and you get a disease. Hmm? That's a gene by environment interaction as well. But here we're not talking about physical changes, we're talking in the environment, we're talking about social changes in the environment. And the famous paper about this, which was assigned and which is, this paper is being constantly re examined, uh, demonstrates what we are talking about. So the promoter activity of the 5-HTT gene in the serotonin pathway can be modified. The short S allele in the 5-HTT uh, promoter region is associated with lower transcriptional efficiency of the promoter compared to the long allele. So that is to say there are two different variants of a, a, a part of this gene that are related to whether the gene is expressed and how often. Up in front of the gene, a kind of on-off switch that says how much of this protein should I produce. And there are different variants of that promoter region, which can make me have even more or less of this uh, protein uh, being produced. And, uh, and what Paxley showed is that if you look at the number of stressful life events and the probability of major depression, he found that actually individuals who had the LL variant, more and more stress was not associated with more and more depression. These individuals seem to be resilient to expressing depression. If you have the LL gene, Pretty much no matter what I do to you, you don't become depressed, okay? But it, the converse of that is that actually the environment is required for the gene to be expressed. So people with the SS allele, the more stressful life events, uh, and this allele is associated with lower efficacy of the gene promoter, the more likely people are to become depressed. Now if I don't stress you, in either case you don't become depressed, right? Over here, it doesn't matter. But if I stress you, and if you have this particular gene variant, then you become depressed. And then you look at the probability of major depression according to whether people were abused as children, right? A very bad social exposure, where ch children are abused because of something that happens in the society around them. And he asks the question, does the response in the future to that abuse depend on what kind of gene you have? Variant here in this one, because, and he says yes, but actually the LL variant, no maltreatment, probable maltreatment, severe maltreatment, no real likelihood of major depression, but the poor people who have the SS variant, if they were maltreated, then they have depression. But if they weren't maltreated, they didn't have depression. So this is not a gene for quote unquote depression, it's a gene quote unquote for depression, if and only if you also have the environmental exposure then conjointly, the gene by environment interaction takes over, and then you express the phenotype. Do you understand that claim being made here? So this is another way that the social can become biological, right? That the social can affect your, 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 uh, your depression by, uh, uh, by interacting with how your um, genes can be uh, expressed. And these results have prompted a lot of scrutiny and attempts at, at uh, confirmation and disconfirmation. And one set of support findings relates to the way that the role of the 5-HTT variation in stress sensitivity coheres across many hypothesis-driven studies in multiple species employing multiple methodologies. So part of Caspi's defense of their original work is to say, look, kind of about how we measure stress, and kind of about how we measure depression. And when we look at lots of different similar mammals, we find similar relationships. So there's this gene by environment interaction. So they look at humans and monkeys and rats and mice, and they use different kinds of gene variation and different kinds of biological phenotypes. You know, in rats, we don't know if they're depressed. We look at anxiety-like behavior and so forth. And they find again and again a similar kind of relationship. So, um, so is this clear? Or just clear, sort of clear, clear enough. Any questions about this? This is an older idea. It's still a very important idea. The evolutionary biologists have been thinking about gene by environment interactions for longer. So the only kind of newish wrinkle here is the sense that the environment could be social and that these effects could also apply in humans and not just in other animals. Well, we just published a paper like a few months ago now, which looked at a completely different uh, gene by environment interaction that actually raises a whole set of other um, ideas. Because we can begin to think about the gene by environment interaction that transcends specific environmental exposures like being abused.
So the CASCI paper looks at a cohort of kids and looks at a specific gene and looks at whether they have a specific environmental exposure, like whether they were abused. Now what we're interested in is looking not just at a single cohort, at a whole population of multiple ages, and not just at a, at a single exposure, but the global environment, the total environment in which the individual might be located. Because we can think of the total milieu in which subjects live as an environment that modifies the effect of genes, and consider the idea that this environment can change across time. Now, this will become clearer in a moment. But what we did in this paper is that in order to evaluate this hypothesis, we use longitudinal data collected over 30 years to test whether an association shown by other geneticists who had gone out and said, look, the FTO gene, allelic variants at the FTO gene at a single nucleotide level, if you have this, allele, this variant, you're more likely to become obese. And if you have that variant, you're less likely to become obese. And everyone accepts those findings as true. That gene is associated with this phenotype, the FTO gene with the obesity phenotype. We went and we took that finding off the shelf and we asked, was that association always the case? Did that association between that genotype and that phenotype occur at all points in historical time? Or only at some points in historical time? And the answer is that it occurs only at some points in historical time. In this case, the FTO gene Individuals that are homozygous or heterozygous from the A allele are known to be at greater risk of obesity. So if you're homozygous AA or heterozygous AT, you're at greater risk for obesity. If you're homozygous TT, you're at lower risk for obesity. And we found that the effects of the gene, i.e. having an A allele, not only vary across age. So for example, here's the age of the person and whether they're obese. And what you see is as people get older, they get fatter. There's nothing surprising about that. And so the effect of the gene varies across age. But we also then looked at whether you were born before 1942 or after 1942. And we compared someone who was 40, who was born before 1942 at a moment in time when he was 40, to someone who was 40 who was born after 1942 at a moment in time when he was 40. And we found a difference between the two. So individuals who had this risk allele, who were born at a different historical point in time, were differentially likely to express a gene. And that's shown even more powerfully in the more common AT genotype to get more separation between the lines. So what we find here is that this is the slope of the, this is what happens if you have the AT genotype across age if you were born before 1942. So there's a weaker effect of this gene. And this is what happens to your BMI if you were born after 1942, a stronger effect of the gene. So the impact of this gene in your body depends on when you were born. Whether this gene is mapped to this phenotype depends on when you were born. Now this is a really, in my judgment, radical claim. Because what this means is at least two things. First, it means that the effects of genes are historically contingent, which is a classic sociological claim. We think that the world we live in depends on our history. I'm not telling you that the effect of your genes depends on our history. Where you are in historical time is associated with whether the gene is mapped to this phenotype. If uh, I look at people who were just born before 1942, I would come to the conclusion that there's no effect of this gene. First point. Second intellectual point, it suggests that we can think of a kind of uncertainty principle or observer effect in genetics. So unlike in the realm of physics where we think of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or observer effects or how the observer affects the thing being observed, what this study says is if the geneticists had gone and done this research in 1950, they would have concluded FTO has no effect on obesity. But if they do today, they include FTO has an effect on obesity. Which suggests that a lot of the genes we think are having effects on phenotypes today, 100 years from now will have no effect. So our belief in how the, how the genes map to the phenotypes is historically contingent. And similarly, many of the genes were missing. We go and we do this study and we say, this gene has no effect on this thing, actually maybe because we're doing the research today. And if we did it yesterday or tomorrow, we might find a different effect, which should be very destabilizing to those of you that are thinking about this idea that there's one-to-one -one mapping between genotypes and phenotypes, the way most of you have been taught biology, right? That if there's some kind of truth, some kind of objective reality that this genotype causes this phenotype, if and only if it's today, if it were 10 years ago or 10 years ago, no, it doesn't. And so now we have a gene-by-environment interaction where the environment is the historical moment 
when the research is being conducted. To me, this is a kind of a, a, a kind of an idea that's obsessing me right now, making me think about all kinds of other uh, crazy things. So the overarching point uh, is that the phenotypic expression of individual level genetic variation and our ability to detect it may depend on historical contingencies. Whether scientists even found an effect of this genotype on this phenotype may depend on when in time the subjects were born and even on when in time the researchers did their research. It's a kind of social observer effect for genetics, as I said. Yes, what's your name? I, uh, yeah, you usually sit over here. I, you can't yes. confuse me by moving. Maybe um, I missed something when you were saying, but didn't, like, didn't diets change for 1942? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yes, thank you so much for saying that. So I didn't mean to suggest that it's some kind of mysterious, if you're born in odd number of years, you know, then your genes have an effect, and even number of years they don't. There are, some, there are global environmental changes that are taking place in our society. So in this study, we cannot tell you what it is. Many things are changing before 1942 and after 1942. Sedentary lifestyles, suburbanization, uh, you know, declining the price of food, social network effects, lots of different things. But the point is, is that all those things combine to create a particular historical moment. And if that historical moment you might find an effect or you might not find an effect of a gene effect. So that's another example of gene by environment interaction. The Caskey study looked at a single gene and a single type of exposure, a known exposure, child abuse, and uh, in a given cohort. This kind of study requires longitudinal data, Caskey does not, where you can follow people across time so that you can compare people of the same age at different time points. And it doesn't look at a single exposure, it looks at the historical moment as the exposure. Other questions? Yeah. Has anyone done that sort of uh, study again, but at a different year as the inflection point? Yeah, so, uh, so the inflection point, so we, there's a whole mathematics here that, that looked at this, and we experimented with different inflection points, and it's all, you can empirically extract the inflection point. Is that what you're asking? So like, so this data is 1942 as the year. Yeah, the, actually, the 1942 emerges from the data. Yeah, we didn't pick 1942. If someone has reproduced this work since we published, we are aware, in Sweden, and shown that the same effect is seen in Swedish populations, but the cut, the inflection points at a different moment in time. And of course, Sweden had a different history than we do. So what is something special about this year, you think? In the United States, yeah, roughly, plus or minus, this epoch, yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think it's 1942, but before and after, yeah. Other questions? All right, so next time we'll talk about social epigenetics, which is another kind of idea. Uh, and then we'll close after that with the three remaining lectures of the class.